Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar presentation, Nothing About Me Without Me, co-building a bipolar app. I would like to remind you all that if there is time at the end of this presentation, we will be open for questions, which if you are attending through Zoom, you can ask in the chat box or the question and answer portion. If you're joining us on Facebook Live, you can just leave a comment. Our presenter today is Dr. Aaron Mihalik. Dr. Aaron Mihalik is a professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada, Program Director for the APEC Digital Hub for Mental Health and Patient Engagement Methods Cluster Lead for the BC Support Unit. Her background is in psychology, with a PhD awarded from the University of Wales College of Medicine in the United Kingdom. Her research expertise lies in bipolar disorder, mood disorders, digital mental health, patient engagement in research, knowledge translation, quality of life, and implementation science. Dr. Mihalik's research has been well supported by the Canadian Institutes of, Men of Health Research, amongst other funders. She is the founder and leader of the collaborative research team for the study of psychosocial issues in bipolar disorder, also known as CREST-BD a Canadian Institutes for Health Research funded network dedicated to collaborative research and knowledge exchange in bipolar disorder. She has published over 100 scientific articles in several books and book chapters. She has been awarded the 2018 Canadian Institute for Health Research Gold Leaf Prize for Transformation in Patient Engagement, Canada's most prestigious recognition for patient engagement in research across all health disciplines. She has also been awarded for the 2019 Douglas Uding Prize, made annually for significant accomplishments in promoting the awareness and treatment of depression in Canada. Thank you so much for joining us today in presenting your research. Thank you. I realize now that that's quite a long bio and it doesn't really say very much about me as a, as a person, does it? I should give you some context. I'm joining you online today from where I live, which is actually outside of Vancouver. Um, it's an area called the Sunshine Coast. Um, so we actually take um, a 30 or 40 minute ferry ride, a boat ride to get to where we live. And um, I'm here uh, with trying to make sure my husband stays out the room while we do this. <laughs> Two giant schnauzers and some Bengal cats who might appear at some point, but hopefully not during, during this webinar. Uh, thank you very much for having me and I'm really excited to be here to um, share really a story, um, a story of the research that we've been doing um, in our CRESPD team for the last 10 or 12 years with a focus on the work we're doing in digital health. Um, so that will be the first objective for my talk today. I'm going to kind of give you a big picture overview of um, the research that we've been doing and a little bit of background on our philosophy for research. Um, and then I'm going to go from that pit, big picture view into a bit of a deeper dive into our flagship project, uh, which was begun last year by Paula Bridges. So let me start by telling you a little bit about our philosophy for research. Um, we specialize in something called community-based participatory research. This isn't uh, new, it's been around for decades, relatively new in mental health though. Um, it's not a method per se, it's more of a kind of orientation to research, a way, an embracement of a way of doing research. Um, for us, that means that at a basic level, everything we do, we do hand in hand with people who live with bipolar disorder, um, healthcare providers and partners. So that means that when we think about the areas that we're going to research, we decide what those will be with community. When we apply for funding, uh, we don't hold any research um, awards that don't have people who live with bipolar disorder as co-investigators or indeed co-leads on those projects. Um, in terms of doing the research, we hire people with bipolar disorder um, and have a number of structures in the network, uh, different forms of ways of, of, for people to engage with us, advisory groups, steering groups. Um, when we publish, we typically publish with pe people with bipolar disorder. And uh, when we present, we often um, present at scientific meetings. 
um, with community as well. So basically it means that we're involving community, the bipolar community, in every step of the research process from beginning to end. When we first began to think about the areas that we would specialize in a network, um, this was about um, 15 years ago at this point, 12, 15 years ago, we consulted with community about where they thought the gaps were in um, bipolar disorder research and knowledge exchange currently. And we're still studying those areas to date. Um, some of them have been a little bit refined, but really we specialize in um, advancing knowledge on quality of life, how to measure quality of life in people with bipolar disorder, um, what different kinds of treatments, what impacts they have on quality of life. Um, secondly, we focus on um, very heavily on the study of self-management strategies, the so things that people do to stay well with this condition, to flourish with it, psychological interventions and treatments, and stigma. All of these um, are still core kind of foci for research for us at this point, um, but many of them now are actually be being done within the realm of um, digital health technologies, digital mental health technologies, which will be the kind of scoping area for this talk that I'm giving you today. So let me begin kind of at the beginning of that story, which was uh, back in 2010. Um, it began with the publication of this paper. It actually took us five years to do this study because um, it was intensive and it involved people with bipolar disorder in multiple steps and waves. Um, but after four or five years of concerted work, uh, we published a scale, a measurement scale, um, to assess quality of life specifically in people with bipolar disorder. So a condition specific scale. Um, and this is what it looks like. It's got uh, 14 areas. There's a long form and a short form. Um, and it me measures some of the areas um, that you would see in any quality of life scale for people with any kind of condition or for people in general population. Things like physical health, uh, relationships and social support, home life. Um, but there are some areas that it also measures that you will know many of you on the line who are a bit more specific or um, of higher priority for people with bipolar disorder. Uh, things like sleep, um, self-esteem, independence, spirituality. Um, so there are some things about this qual BD scale uh, that are a bit more geared for people with this particular condition. This is the brief version of that, just 12 items. This is the one that's been picked up quite heavily in the clinical trial, trial literature and is being used in different types of treatment studies to look at the impacts of both medication and psychosocial treatments on outcomes. And then there's a longer form as well. This is the 56 item version of the Qual BD. It only takes about five minutes to complete um, and uh, has uh, four questions in each of the different domains or life areas. So let me pause here and point out the obvious to you. We were actually very proud at this point of what we had done. We um, had produced a scale that works really well psychometrically. So it's got good validity, it's got good reliability, it's sensitive to change. Um, but there's a problem with this in that it's a paper and pencil version. If you wanted to use this yourself, you would need to score it manually. If you needed to use it with your clinician, you'd then be taking a pencil, pe paper and pencil version into them or faxing it to them even. Um, and so there's a real barrier in terms of actually using this on the ground for both healthcare providers and um, people with bipolar disorder. So the next obvious step for us in terms of the research program around this was to make a web-based version of this scale. So a couple of years after it was published and produced, we began the process of working with people with bipolar disorder um, to think about if you're going to take the core BD and put it online, what functionality should it have? How should it look? What are the key features for it? Um, and even back at this time, we were using kind of co-design days to think about the online tools that we were developing for bipolar disorder. So this particular one was done with a team of about 40, 45 people, about two thirds of them were living with a bipolar disorder. Um, some were healthcare providers and clinicians, some were researchers. And of course, I'm always gonna make the caveat and point out here that people wear multiple hats. You can be a healthcare provider who's living with bipolar disorder, of course, and many, some of the researchers in our network um, uh, also live with bipolar disorder too, in, including one of the co-leads of the network. So there's a mixed, diverse group of expertise at this day. And we came together for a full day to talk about um, how this qual 
tool, quality of life tool should look. And uh, for this particular event, we did that by conducting focus groups with people, some kind of lower level user centered design methods, which I'm going to describe to you in a little bit more detail and graphic facilitation methods. So art based methods to capture the, um, the uh, con content of what was going on during the day. And this was the process that we went through um, in terms of showing people some prototypes for how that tool would look. So we'd already worked with our IT company before this event and asked them to mock up some ideas for um, ways of graphically representing quality of life data. And we showed these to people and garnered input from the community at the uh, engagement day about what they thought of the tools. And this was one version. People hated it. They said it looked really arachnid or spider-like didn't like that one. Um, we presented them with an option for kind of traditional bar charts and line charts. They thought that was overly medicalized. They essentially um, did what they do so well, which is tore apart most of our ideas and designed something else from the ground up. Um, and this was the kind of imagery that people wanted from that day. They wanted something that had um, a holistic representation of well-being. Quality of life, of course, is a positive construct. Um, and they wanted really high functionality and very um, high ease of use out of this tool. So we took away the knowledge from that day, um, took it back to our IT team and developed this product, the quality of life tool. Um, and you'll see as you work through that tool online that it works through, it has the same structure basically as the Core BD, same questions, um, but it's much easier to use. Um, and uh, gives you different types of output at the end about your scores, different ways of sharing it with your clinician, shows you the areas you're flourishing in, shows you some of the areas that you're struggling in. There have been a few publications on this, um, on this uh, study since then. Uh, one of these is literally, I think, just about to be published in the um, JMIR Mental Health Journal. This one's been led by Dr. Emma Morton, who's um, a postdoc with our group, really stellar, probably one of the world's best quality of life and bipolar disorder researchers at this point. Um, and uh, she's just finished a study which compared how this quality of life tool, tool performs in its online version versus its paper and pencil version. Um, and happily, it um, measures quality of life in pretty much the same way as the paper and pencil version. So another ingredient in this kind of program of research we have that tells us that our science isn't drifting too much, our measurement systems aren't drifting too much as we move from all the forms of measurement into online spaces. At the same time that we were doing this, we were also developing, again, with Canadian Institutes of Health Research funding, a bipolar wellness center. Um, this is a one-stop shop for people with bipolar disorder, and there's a sec there are sections in there as well for healthcare providers. Um, to the cut to the chase of the best of the information that we have on strategies for self-management of bipolar disorder. If you visit this site, you'll see that it's organized in um, the same way as the quality of life scale is. So within the Bipolar Wellness Center, there are 14 different domains or areas. Um, and in each of those, you'll find um, a sort of high level summary of the current ev evidence on self-management strategies in each of these areas, concrete tools that you can apply. So for example, tools for sleep hygiene and sleep management, tools for mood, and then a number of other um, resources as well. So that's the uh, quality of life tool, the Bipolar Wellness Center. Of course, we weren't being funded by the Canadian government to just build websites. We were being funded um, instead to look, or as well as to look at not only um, can you build really solid and safe and evidence-informed um, online spaces for people with bipolar disorder, but um, how can you help them access the information in them? And so the next study that we did actually tested out different, we would call them knowledge translation methods. So basically different ways of um, helping people with BD to um, get to that self-management and self-care information. And these were the four things that we tested out. Webinars, shorter than the one that we're doing today, 15 or 20 minutes. Um, we developed one webinar by a Crest BD expert focusing on each of those self-management domains. Videos, each of these videos featured Victoria Maxwell, who some of you may know. She is a mental health educator and actress who herself lives well with bipolar disorder type one as a foundational 
um, Crest BD member. These videos were very short in nature um, and each, again, focused on one self-care area, self-management area, so one on sleep, one on mood, for example. Then we also looked at workshops. So the workshops that we did were face-to-face. -face. They were two and a half hours in length. We addressed two different quality of life areas, domains in each workshop. In, in each workshop. So mood and sleep. They were co-delivered by academics in the team and people with lived experience. And they used a bunch of different methods. So sort of didactic teaching methods, role play, small group work. We delivered those um, on the east side of Canada in partnership with the Mood Disorders Association of Ontario. And then finally, uh, we looked at something called a living library, which was essentially a kind of telehealth system where people with bipolar disorder were matched up with an expert peer living with bipolar disorder. And it was the living library expert's job to tour the person with bipolar disorder um, around the Bipolar Wellness Center and kind of contextualize and tailor the self-management strategies in there for that particular person. So here is the data on that particular project, which was also published in JMIR. This is kind of interesting what happens here. So these lines, um, which are, well, first of all, all of these bars are measuring something called chronic disease self-efficacy. So this is basically your beliefs around your ability to self-manage your chronic health conditions. So to self-manage your bipolar disorder. And what you can see on the lines here is that um, the two interventions with less human contact, so specifically that's the webinars and the videos actually um, had a bit of a negative impact on people's perceptions of their um, ability to manage their bipolar disorder. The two elements with more human uh, contact, the workshops and the living library intervention actually drove that association in the other direction. They had a positive impact. And so when we looked at these results and started to unpack them, the main message that we got from this, this is pilot data, this was a small study, about 90 or so people, but still this, this data began to tell us much in keeping with the wider literature into, in digital health, digital mental health, it began to tell us that um, it's really important not to lose the human side of connections when you drive online in mental health spaces. Much of the change in the power that we have in online interventions is around the people who are in those interventions themselves. Okay. So just to recap, I've shown you the quality of life tool, our Qual BD paper and pencil version, our bipolar wellness center, and some of the data from that. Um, we were at a point in time, um, however, facing problems that the wider field is facing in terms of digital mental health. We still have barely any evidence on the many um, online interventions, tools, and apps that are available for people with bipolar disorder, mood disorders, and other health conditions. The evidence base is still really lacking and weak in this area. You can download over 10,000 apps, one of 10,000 apps for mental health conditions at this point in time. You can hold in two hands the number of them have really good quality data on them yet. There are also issues around privacy, aren't there? And that, um, well, you know this, our data is often being sold without us realizing it's being sold. Um, we often don't understand the very long terms of agreement um, and the privacy um, ramifications of the different apps and online spaces that we're using. So that's an issue. And then another issue is that when we look at people with bipolar disorder using different online tools and websites and mobile apps, those are pieces of data, they're islands of data, and they're not properly interconnected yet. It's often very difficult to look at the relationship, say, between your mood and sleep. If you're using a sleep app or um, a sleep support website um, and something else for mood, but it's difficult to put those two pieces together at the moment, isn't it? And then critically for us, um, most of the online applications that we're developing and building aren't being built for diverse users. Um, and so we're really focusing it 
in the next generation of our work in Crestpedia trying to tackle some of these outstanding issues. Let me tell you about how we're trying to do that. So this is our new project by Paula Bridges, um, again funded by CIHR in Canada. It's a three-year project. We're uh, coming up to the end of the first nine months of it at this point. And it's got uh, a few objectives, a few things it's trying to do. First of all, it's going to develop a beta version of a next generation app, a mobile app, and an IT platform, um, which is um, more secure and safe than many of the IT platforms that we're using for health and digital innovations right now. Um, it's going to be a system where um, there'll be a new app that's developed. We're calling it Anchors app at this point. That app will have the capability of pulling in data from the other apps that the person with bipolar disorder is using them, is using putting them together and making sense of them in one place. I'll tell you more about that as we go along, but it's really trying to address that problem I talked about before about the islands of data and trying to pull data together with the permission of the user. The user is the person in control of where that get data goes and doesn't go, but to, be, and to pull it together into one centralized home. There's gonna be a research study in year two of the project once the app is built to look at actually pretty simple um, evaluation outcomes <laughs> these aren't often done um, in uh, in many uh, many of the apps that are being developed but we're looking at you know can we build it is it feasible do people engage with it we have some pretty sophisticated measures of engagement that we're going to be using uh, do people use it do they keep using it does it have an impact on quality of life that's the um, Thing that we're driving towards here is the primary outcome is quality of life in bipolar disorder and if it does have an impact on quality of life um, what are the, what's driving that what are the mechanisms of change and we have some hypotheses specifically that we'll be testing about those um, proposed mechanisms of change as we predict um, and then its other objective, this is in the final year of the project, is to use AI or machine learning um, to see whether we can predict whether people engage with the app and use it, and whether uh, machine learning techniques can be used to predict quality of life outcomes. This in itself is an interesting question because the majority of work so far in machine learning and AI is actually trying to predict either biomarkers, biomedical outcomes, or dysfunction, symptoms, um, and relapse. And so there are actually very few studies so far that are trying to, to predict quality of life, well-being, uh, positive outcomes using machine learning techniques. So um, that'll be an interesting stage of the project for us when we get there. Now I'm gonna tell you in a little bit more detail now about uh, some of the co-design methods that we're going to be using for Bipolar Bridges and some of the ways that you can engage with us if you're interested in this project and get involved in helping us <laughs> deliver this pretty scopey project that we're trying to deliver. Um, this is interesting. Um, this, these are personas. I wonder how many of you have heard of personas. I bet some of you have already. You certainly will have had a persona built on you at some point. Pretty much every time you buy a product, a pair of Lululemon pants, buy a car, buy a particular grocery store product, there'll be a big machine of marketing that's gone behind um, the development of that pro pro product and figuring it out how to market it for specific purchases, essentially. And I look at this slide, on oh, full disclosure, I stole these slides from Dr. Emma Morton, they're her creations, so they're not mine, so thank you, Emma, for these. Um, but I look at this, the, the, these images, which is some older um, images around persona development for marketing, and they kind of make me laugh because they're so highly stereotypical, aren't they? Actually kind of annoying when you look at them. Um, but then I was thinking about it and thinking, well, actually, that's exactly what personas in marketing are use, used for. They're used um, to identify the stereotypical person that's going to be buying your product. Um, and they're an effective tool for that. But it's a really interesting question to start thinking about, you know, how can you use an approach that has decades of use in marketing uh, very effectively, but how can you use it in a way that's more community focused, community engaged? And essentially, how can you take an exercise like this and harness it to think about diverse users? 
And so that's what we've been trying to do with Bipolar Bridges, thinking about how can we use persona building as an activity, but actually think about building a tool, um, Bipolar Bridges specifically, um, in a way that it works for people from different walks of life. Um, we do um, a reasonable job of developing apps, mental health apps, for um, typically middle-aged, middle-class white people, frankly. Uh, we don't do a terribly good job of, of developing apps that work and feel like home for people of different genders, of people of LGBTQ2 communities, uh, racialized immigrant populations. Um, and so um, this is really the next piece of work for us in Crest to try and do this piece. So when you look at traditional approaches to persona development, um, typically they are developed based on qualitative data, expert knowledge. They will develop a primary persona, one persona, thinking about the target user and the market demographics associated to those people. And they're used by the design team to identify relevant features. If you think about using these for a co-design approach instead, uh, what we're trying to do and apply is personas, co-designing um, personas uh, with people with lived experience of bipolar disorder. Um, and those people are being uh, picked specifically for diversity because what we think, um, what we um, hazard a guess is that if you design an app that works for people who are most marginalized, most vulnerable, face the most barriers to accessing care and treatment and healthcare support systems. If you design an app that works for them, then you're probably going to have an app that works well for um, the people in the middle of that, um, the more common users of healthcare systems, people who face fewer barriers to care. We've begun this process. So we began whiteboarding as a group. Um, what these personas would look like. Again, we're using art-based methods, graphic facilitation methods to do this. You don't need me to tell you that many people with bipolar disorder really embrace creative methods. And we so we find art-based methods are really useful for us in terms of research and particularly this, types of, this type of research. And then um, once that phase is over and we've gone through some more cons consultation steps, we then, um, we're actually planning, of course, on doing this face-to-face. -face. These methods will actually probably occur online at this point, but we'll be doing a series of focus groups across Canada. Maybe one advantage of being online so much right now is that we can actually do them in North America, in the US, as well as Canada. Um, and we'll, but we'll basically be doing them um, using a blend of traditional qualitative methods where we're asking a set of detailed questions about, um, about the development of personas um, and um, using, at the same time, using that um, persona development exercise to inform, inform the development of the Anchors apps. So some of the questions we'll be use, asking in the focus groups are things like, what are the potential motivations for using an app to track and support quality of life in bipolar disorder? What barriers do you envision facing? Um, what motivators? And then on the basis of that, how can we design a tool that works optimally? And this is what um, a, a written or a, a pictorial version of a persona would look like, just to give you an idea um, of how that works visually. Okay, so let's uh, take a step back again and think about, well, what might be some of the barriers or the assets for this type of an approach in terms of research of this nature, digital health research, e-health research. Um, one of some of the issues here, the potential barriers are that um, these types of processes working hand in hand heavily with community, of course, they take more time. Um, we know from experience and we know from research that one of the worst things you can do in community engagement is tokenistic engagement, hit and run consultations, where you go and get what you need from communities and then leave, um, leaves people feeling rightly abused and taken advantage of. Um, it's much better to have relationships that are founded, um, that have foundational trust, um, where people understand the vision for the research that you're doing. 
Um, but there are other things that take more time. Of course, you know, you need to get ethics applications for all of this, um, which is very important, but is another layer of time and complexity. And there's still relatively little published in terms of guidance about how to apply user-centered design principles and methods to actually building apps in this space. Having said all of that, though, there are a number of assets as well. So, um, you know, obviously, obviously, it sounds obvious to me, but user involvement from the outset can really help us make sure that we're on the right path. It can stop um, or at least um, reduce the risk of dead ends. Um, or it establishes much of the groundwork that's needed for subsequent study phases. Um, it gives you the opportunity of building trust with often uh, marginalized um, groups and it speeds the pipeline, potentially speeds the pipeline to impact. Okay, so having gone through that, shown you what we've done over the last 10 or 15 years, showing you what we're going to do over the next two years or so, I'd like to kind of end with some ways for you to get engaged with us. Um, I mentioned to you the persona development exercise. I would suggest that you watch our websites, which I'll be giving you the links to at the end. If um, you would potentially, if this study really gets you going and you're really intrigued by it, um, then there are multiple ways to get involved. There are um, advisory groups that we're setting up. We'll be doing a lot of user testing. We'll be running those focus groups that I mentioned. Um, so the best thing to do is to sign up for our newsletter and then, and then uh, we'll stay on top of our so social media uh, which is where we advertise the different opportunities as they come out. This one is currently recruiting right now. So we have two versions of a survey um, that are online currently. I told you earlier that the Bipolar Bridges um, platform or the Anchors app that sits on top of it um, is going to be um, helping consolidate different apps for bipolar disorder. Part of that process and it's really lengthy and time intensive that we're going through right now is trying to hand pick, cherry pick, just a few, say six or so apps to test in the system initially. So we're going through the process of saying, okay, well, what's the best way or method of measuring sleep? What's the best app for mood measurement currently? But we don't want to actually just pick the best ones from a research lens. We also want to know what people are actually using in the real world right now, because we don't want to all say, recommend one particular sleep monitoring app and everybody's already got another app downloaded on their phone and are really enjoying it and finding it very useful. So we're using different types of methods to figure out which have the best um, properties, which apps are safest and most evidence informed, for example, and which apps are people actually currently using on the ground right now. So that's a long way of saying that these two surveys that we have online right now are asking just that, about what apps are you using for sleep? What are you using for mood? If you're not using any, actually, that's interesting for us too, because we want to know about some of the barriers that people are facing um, in working in online environments currently. There's a version of the survey which is designed um, or tailored for people with bipolar disorder. It takes about 10, 15, sometimes a little bit longer minutes to complete, depending on how many apps you're using currently. And then there's a healthcare provider version, which is typically taking about five minutes for people to complete. Um, and both of these are, are still recruiting and we have about 150 people with bipolar disorder who've done the first one so far. Um, and uh, Healthcare providers are actively doing the second one. So please, if you have a little bit of extra time right now, uh, join us in that process. This is how they look. They're all uh, tried to be designed for um, ease of applications. The surveys are as simple as we can make them. And then this is our CRESPD website. This is the home we have for um, our academic research findings. Um, and I just wanted to end before we go to the Q&A by mentioning that the other thing that we've been doing recently is a series of uh, Zoom webinars, much like this one. We are holding them weekly or bi-weekly right now. Um, they're all designed for bipolar disorder, but really are open to anybody in the community, uh, family, friends, healthcare providers, people with other health conditions. We're asking community to pick the topics that we cover in each one. Um, we heard very clearly that the first two um, people were really looking for anxiety management tools, and so that's what we provided. Um, and the one coming up tomorrow, which is at 11 a.m. our time in Vancouver, which um, is 2 o'clock 
Eastern and then seven o'clock in the UK is being um, starring Fiona Lobin, who's a wonderful researcher from the Spectrum Group in the UK. Um, and Victoria Maxwell is co-presenting on each of these um, talk BVD events too. So feel free to join us for one of those or to catch the live recordings of those which are available via our websites. A uh, huge thank you to our funders. It's only with healthcare research funding that we can actually be responsive like this during times like the pandemic that we're experiencing right now. It's health research funding that allows us to be in digital spaces right now and to support people with bipolar disorder, their friends and family members and clinicians as much as we can in the best way that we can. And finally, I'll just leave you with um, the links to go find all of our stuff. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for this um, innate, like this informative lecture. Um, this is valuable information and I know all of your research will result in such an incredibly beneficial and useful app for our community. Um, so now I would like to open this up for some questions. We still have a few minutes. Um, you can either, again, as I said, ask if you're participating in Zoom in the chat box or question and answer portion. And if you're on Facebook Live in the comment section. So we do have a quick question to start off. Uh, one of the participation or participants is asking if this survey um, is open to only Canadian residents or US residents can participate as well or who in the world can participate in this survey? Anybody. What a great question. Thank you. I should have mentioned that. You know, initially um, we had designed it just for North America. Uh, we need, we had wanted to get, you know, at least a couple of hundred people with bipolar disorder um, to complete it and um, at least a hundred clinicians to complete it. Um, and we figured we would need to open out to the US in order to get those kind of numbers as well. Um, and we have a lot of people that we support in the States as well. Um, but then we very quickly realized that taking an international lens would um, really provide some data that was needed uh, in a global mental health context. So it's actually open to anybody in the world, um, although it's only available in English. And so when this app has been, you know, when the project is finished and hopefully when the app is developed, will it be accessible to anyone in the world or will it be for more North America? Um, um, it will be, um, it will be co-designed with people from the North American context to a certain extent. Um, this is very, this is, it sounds ridiculous, but it's, it's going to take us three years to do this project. And this is just the first stage of the project. So what we want to do at the end of that three years is have an app that's functional and that will be released for public use. Um, but there'll be another, hopefully another project phase where, where it will be tested in, in a larger study. But if you think about um, what's needed in, in digital mental health care, is you, if you find a product that works and you have evidence that it works, what you then need to do is tailor it and we call it scaling up. So you need to adapt it for different countries, different contexts, and different populations. And so we'll be able to take the technological platform for this. And you could actually at that point develop it for any other condition as well. So uh, we envision that parts of this will be open source. And if you wanted to, to use the technology to develop a version of it for borderline personality, sort of for autism, whatever, you could do that. Or you could um, work with us or take it and adapt it for application in other specific countries, languages, or contexts. Great question. Okay. Um, and then another kind of question, so this participant has seen a correlation between different symptoms with different phases of their menstrual cycle. Mm -hmm. To what extent do these tools include data on feminine mm -hmm. cycles? You know, that's so interesting. We, so we started to look, of course, at the, about, you know, I mentioned about 150 people have done the survey so far. Um, and there are a lot of people using menstruation cycle apps and fertility apps as well. Um, and then mood apps, some of those have a mood uh, measurement component, but they're often using a mood app at the same time. Um, there's a strong literature looking at um, hormones, bipolar disorder, mood states, um, menopause. So there's rich data there. Um, the idea would be that there, we won't be putting in um, one of those apps currently for this version, but um, that would be a perfect example of the type of adaptation that we could do in a later phase of the study. Um, and really when it goes live, if it works, once Anchor App by Polar Bridges is released, 
the system at that point would allow the users to pull in whatever apps they want. So we're only choosing six right now um, because we need to kind of keep this relatively controlled for the testing period and want to be careful about which apps we pick. Once it goes live, if it works and it's released live, then the person using it would pull in whatever, literally whatever apps they wanted to, as long as the app has something called, has an API, so has a, is compatible for use with the system, has an open, an open element to it. Um, that is really interesting how adaptable it can be in the future. If we make it work, that's a caveat, right? So we have to build it and make it work first. So <laughs> hopefully it does. <laughs> um, and then another question, and I think this might be our final question, just kind of going back to the beginning of the presentation. Um, one participant is wondering if the quality of life tool is still accessible. Um, oh, it is. Um, yeah, uh, where they can find it. Um, can you still see my slide share here? It's this one, bdqol.com. Perfect. Great. Well, Those are great questions. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you, everybody, for, um, for all of those questions. If you do, um, if you're watching the recording or if you think of another additional question, uh, feel free to email me at info at ibpf.org and I can pass the question along. Um, and thank you again so much, Dr. Mahalik, for such an informative lecture. Um, and thank you for sharing yeah, the Talk BD um, presentation. I hope everybody who's watching this um, participates in that tomorrow. And um, this webinar recording will be available on our website and our YouTube channel. So I invite you all to visit www.ibpf.org to learn more about our upcoming webinars and stay connected via our monthly newsletter. We thank everybody for attending and we wish you all a wonderful week. Have a great day, you guys. Thank you.